Hi, I'm Hidden Valley Observatory Director and producer of Dakota Starry Nights here on YouTube channel. And welcome to this workshop on night vision astronomy. Well, we got a lot of ground to cover here, so let's just jump right into the pond. Now, night vision, when applied to astronomy, is the ability to see an object of low magnitude using a technological means of image intensification. Received photons from galaxies, stars, and certain nebulae are magnified or brightened by an image intensifier. Now, the image intensifier is a vacuum-based device that can generate an image from a small number of photons so that certain objects of low magnitude can be viewed in real time by the naked eye and typically through a telescope. Photons from a dimly lit source enter the objective lens on the left and strike the photocathode plate. The photocathode, which is negatively biased, releases electrons which are accelerated to the higher voltage microchannel plate. Each electron causes multiple electrons to be released from the microchannel plate. The electrons are drawn to the higher voltage phosphorus screen. Electrons that strike the phosphorus screen cause the phosphorus to produce photons of light viewable through the eyepiece lens. So in short, it's a major game changer for astronomy. Now let's talk about what night vision is not good on. And that's typically nebulae in the O3 line. Roughly between 480 and 515 nanometer wavelengths. This puts it far left of 650 nanometers out of night vision's optimized band pass. Other things night vision is not good on is colorful stars, the reason being obvious. Planets are too bright for night vision without heavy filtering, in which case the detail is lost and close doubles. Star images are large with night vision, so close companions are covered by the electronic halo produced by the photocathode tube. So what can you expect to see with night vision? Simply put, it can double or even triple your aperture by increasing the signal of your light grasp electronically. And for those of you living under light polluted skies, night vision astronomy can greatly reduce the effects of light pollution through the use of narrowband filters like hydrogen alpha predominantly and long pass filters of 610 nanometers and longer. Now here are a couple of targets that were imaged right here at the Hidden Valley Observatory just last night to give you an idea of what you can expect to see. Uh, we're have like unfortunately about cat five skies due to the light pollution in rapid city and i was using this uh, explorer scientific modest eight inch newtonian uh, with the night vision uh, pbs 14 up here a batter coma corrector and this is all two inch so the first object is m42 without night vision that's the orion nebula and you can see there's really not much to look at here. Uh, some stars and that's about it. And now here's the same target, uh, Orion Nebula, with night vision. So there's a dramatic difference. So let's move on to the Horse Head and Flame Nebula. There's really not much to look at. Uh, there, you can see Alnitok there and a couple of the other stars, but that's about it. And, and when I was doing the photography uh, without night vision, I had to double the ISO because I wasn't getting any signal and I had to bump up the exposure by a second. These are basically two second exposures. So now here is the horse head and the flame with night vision. Dramatic difference, and you could see the notch there. This is at 15 power, so you know you're not going to have super high definition here because of the uh, the scale that we're dealing with. But it's undoubtedly the flame is there and the horse head's there. It's pretty amazing to see the horse head with just eight inches of aperture. Okay, so now let's move on to the Rosette Nebula. Okay, so here we are without night vision, and there's really nothing there. I mean, nothing. There's some stars there in the core of the rosette. And now here it is with night vision, and you can immediately recognize it. I mean, it's, it's not with adverted vision or anything like that. It is just there. It is there. 
Now, incidentally, the horse head has never been visually seen here before at the observatory. So this is this is a first. And uh, some of these other targets, uh, like the rosette, uh, on a really, really, really good night years ago when the skies were darker out here, you might detect a slight smudge, but never with the kind of definition that, that you can see right now. So it's pretty amazing. Okay, so there's basically uh, three generations of night vision technology, although some would argue there's four. And depending on the generation that you have, it's going to make the difference between seeing something or not seeing anything at all. So generally speaking, uh, Gen 1 was introduced during the Vietnam War, were quite bulky and required moonlight or an infrared spotlight to enhance their ability to see distances in the dark. A Gen 2 is better, but lacks the very long spectrum response that Gen 3 tubes have, though the very best Generation 2 tubes are somewhat comparable to some of the mid-range Generation 3 tubes. Gen 3 tubes further improved on image resolution and increased tube light. The light amplification is also improved to around 30,000 to 50,000 times. So perhaps you've deducted by now that night vision is really a lot to do about the tubes inside. So it's worth going over it in a bit more detail here. The minimum tube specs for astronomy are a signal to noise ratio 24 or more with a good EBI and 64 lines of resolution. It should give you a great view. Photocathode response should have a minimum of 1800. Higher is better. Electronic background input or EBI should be 2.5 or less. Halo should be 1 or less. This is the electronic halo produced by a bright star or light. The brighter the star, the larger the halo, which is why these things are not good for splitting doubles. In turn, a halo rating of one or less is what you're after. Anything lower than these specs and you're likely to be disappointed. So now we'll move on to the tube housing. Uh, there are different configurations. And basically the two form factors of the tube housing currently being used in night vision astronomy is the PVS-14, which you see right here, and the Mod 3 Bravo. But regardless of the housing you decide on, manual gain adjustment is a must-have for astronomy. Now, more on that later, but the manual gain on this one is just right down here on the PVS-14. The Mod 3 Bravo is really one side of a night vision binocular. The optics can be standard or C-mount. C-mount provides a quick detached camera lens adapter interface. It allows the user to remove the lenses and attach other lenses for use in other applications such as photography. C-mount Mod 3Bs are for camera and telescope use only. They do not come with any provision for attaching to helmets, nor do they come with an objective lens assembly. The C-mount is designed to interface with a user-supplied camera lens or telescope. So now there's some other variations of photo cathode tube for night vision astronomy that are housed in eyepieces, but these have very limited application when compared to the PVS-14 or the Mod 3 Bravo configuration, so uh, we're not going to be covering those here today. Now the PVS-14 I have here was built for versatility, durability, and the standard issue night vision optics for the U.S. military. A PVS-14 can be mounted on a helmet for hands-free operation, used as a handheld device or as a weapon sight or behind a red dot finder on a telescope. Sight it behind this red dot and you are like in an area that you're trying to do a star alignment in a light polluted area. You could use this PVS-14 behind your red dot and boom, the stars open up. You can see a lot more stars. This is going to make it a whole lot easier. It's pretty amazing. This one is a third generation pinnacle auto gated unit with manual gain adjustment that allows you to dial in the object you're looking at and control scintillization, the little sparkles in the background. Auto gated tubes are better in environments with a lot of ambient light and bright light sources or when going from very dark to bright environments. 
Autogated tubes will not bloom under these circumstances. This also maintains the optimum performance of the tube and protects the user from temporary blindness and extends tube life. Because I use it for scouting during night landscape photography, this feature is very useful. Typically, the PVS-14 housing is argon or nitrogen purged before sealing to keep the optics clear. The PVS-14 can be readily adapted to attach to an eyepiece for an A-focal arrangement, like you see here. I have this attached to a 55 millimeter plossel. This, in turn, allows you to increase the speed of your night vision platform. An increase in speed equates to an increase in light gathering, but more on that later. Now let's take a quick look at filters used in night vision. There's some good news here because you really need only one or two. If you live close or in semi-urban locations and are working with 72 to 120 millimeters of aperture, you should find a 610 nanometer long pass filter useful in knocking back city lights. A long pass filter simply blocks light that is shorter than its specified pass. So a 610 nanometer long pass filter will allow light longer than 610 to shine through. Simple. But if you have telescopes scope aperture of 150 millimeters or more, then you're likely to find a 12 or 7 nanometer hydrogen alpha narrowband filter more useful and a 650 nanometer long pass filter for galaxies and such. Which brings us to filter size and placement. I prefer 2 inch filters because you can also use them for imaging with most cameras. And my workhorse eyepiece is the 55 millimeter Teleview 2 inch fossil. So now, when using a filter for afocal viewing, a PVS 14 attached to an eyepiece, the best place to put the narrowband filter is not in front of the night vision unit, but at the bottom of the eyepiece, coma corrector, or filter wheel. Now, without getting too technical here, the light at the edge of the 40 degree field of view of the night vision unit comes in at an angle that is 20 degrees from normal incidence. At this angle, wavelengths different from hydrogen alpha pass through and interfere with the hydrogen alpha line. Your object can disappear or diminish greatly as a result. So you want to get that filter on the bottom of that optical train. Now earlier I stated that a focal arrangement, what you see here, see this is one piece here, this is the plossel here, and this is the PVS-14, and there's an adapter here that connects these two together. So the a focal arrangement increases the speed of the platform. Speed is essential for good night vision performance. The more of it you have, the more you see. A focal lets you use a longer length eyepiece as a focal reducer. This in turn allows a decoupling of the system's exit pupil or virtual aperture of the optical system from the human eye's maximum pupil size of 7 millimeters. Your telescope needs to fully exploit this to reach the full capacity of the platform by increasing the system's exit pupil and flood the photocathode tube with light. You want a super fast telescope with a ridiculously large exit pupil. A PVS-14 was designed to work at f1.2. The more f-stops you can put between your photo cathode and the field stop glass of the eyepiece, the more you're going to see. This is why focal ratio is the primary performance consideration ahead of aperture when it comes to night vision astronomy. Telescopes with very long focal lengths, 2400 millimeters or more, are not good scopes for night vision astronomy. With that in mind, it's time now for some math that will help you build an effective night vision platform. So assume you have a 6 inch F8 telescope. That means the scope has 48 inches of focal length from 6 inches times F8. Converting 48 inches to millimeters equals 1200 millimeters of focal length from 48 times 25 millimeters. With that, you can determine the focal reduction an eyepiece provides when attached to a PVS-14. 
To start, divide the exit pupil that the scope eyepiece provides into the focal length of the objection of the night vision device or PVS-14. For example, if I use a 40 millimeter eyepiece in my 12 inch f4.9 daub, this would give an 8.16 exit pupil. If you divide 8.16 into 26, the focal length of the PVS-14, you get 3.16. 1.8. So that would be the effective focal reduction you would get when using a 40 millimeter eyepiece in this particular scope. It's all in the math here. Which brings us to eyepieces. The eyepiece adapter developed by Teleview attaches to a number of their eyepieces. But long story short, the Teleview 55mm Plasso is my workhorse. It's cheap, well made, lots of light, and tremendous field of view. For the shorter focal lengths, some of the higher end ones like the Delos or the Delight might be worth a look. But keep in mind, the field of view of any eyepiece will be reduced to 40 degrees by the PBS-14. My favorite platform at the moment is this Explorer Scientific 208mm F3.9 Newtonian, a Teleview 55m Plossel, right down here I showed you earlier, and a batter coma corrector. This yields an exit pupil of 14.1 millimeters at 2.6 true field of view and 15 power. Now those images I showed you earlier were shot with this platform and it's all working at a screaming F1.84. That's what you want. There's a need for speed here. Now some will argue that this is a pretty long imaging train to be hanging off the end of your scope. Fair enough. That's why you want to avoid inch and a quarter connections and keep it all two inches like I've got here. Properly balanced, it doesn't pose any problems with tracking or go-tos on this Orion Atlas Pro AZ EQG go-to. It's been a wonderful mount and I'm really enjoying it and it handles this with ease. I've also put the same platform on an Explorer Scientific Twilight 2 with no problems. So when you're looking around for scopes, you definitely want a really good focuser so that it can handle this imaging train and you won't have any problems with it. Now you're going to find a dew shield really helpful in preventing any stray or ambient light from entering into the optical system and being amplified by the PVS-14, which in turn will reduce the signal to noise ratio of the object you're looking at and increase synthelization. Now synthelization is this little sparkly stuff that you'll see uh, due to the accelerated electrons into the system and that's why your manual gain is really important because with manual gain you can dial that down and get it right to where you want it. It really makes a big difference here. So to wrap it up, if you would like to pursue night vision astronomy further, there's some good intel to be had online, like the Cloudy Nights EAA Observation and Equipment Forum has a wealth of information on the subject. Take your time before you decide to take the plunge and only buy from reputable companies and avoid places like eBay for this kind of purchase. These things are spendy and it's advisable not to buy used. The tubes have a service life and it's difficult to determine how many hours a tube may have on it already. Make sure your PVS-14 comes with a test report on the tube and a five or more year warranty. Most places will warranty their tubes for 10 years. If they tell you they can't provide a tube report or only provide a tube warranty of one year or less, look someplace else. This is where the established reputable companies come into light. A 10 year warranty with a one night stand operation is not going to be of any use. I purchased this PVS-14 for this workshop at jrhenterprises.com. There's a link in the description here below. I got a great tube at a great price and it came with a 10 year warranty. And they also answer emails. The PVS-14 eyepiece adapter was purchased at tnvc.com, another great company for night vision gear. And if you found this information useful, give us a thumbs up. We'd appreciate it. Clear skies.